So, um, <clears throat> Child Protection League is a Minnesota nonprofit that we were founded in uh, 2013. And we're a group of Christian women from various denominations, but it is not a Christian ministry. It's a nonprofit dealing with ch children's issues having to do with exploitation, indoctrination, and violence against uh, children. And we deal with quite a number of different issues. Um, um, let's see if I can find my way down here. Uh, and I've been asked today to, to focus on uh, what's called sexual orientation slash gender identity issues. So the, the acronym is SOGI, SOGI, so sexual orientation, gender identity. We deal with other issues having to do with the way uh, kids get, are getting porn on their corn, Chromebook in school. Um, they're bypassing the filters and we need to, we're trying to get people aware of that. I'm not gonna talk about that. We talk about the right to freedom of conscience uh, in schools. Uh, we, we work opposing them teaching Islam in the schools, in the public schools, right to pri physical privacy, transformational education, a lot of different issues. But today, it is just sexual orientation, gender identity. So it's become apparent to us that children have been targeted for a long time to advance the expansion and normalization of LGBTQ, and that means, you know, lesbian, gay, transgender, um, uh, LG, be a bisexual, and then Q they've added because it means just everything else. But that everything else is pretty significant. Um, so uh, in 2012, uh, Anoka Hennepin, which is the largest school district in the state, uh, had a, uh, they were, their, their neutrality policy on, uh, on homosexuality uh, and transgender was challenged as being uh, dangerous to children. They had a neutrality meeting that you can, you're not gonna support it, you're not gonna oppose it, you're just gonna, I mean, that issue is there's some information out on it. They were challenged because they were saying people were committing, children are committing suicide, and the reason was because they were, they were being oppressed. So uh, the actual, the federal courts came in, the Department of Justice, and put a federal consent decree on the school district and forced them to institute all kinds of uh, uh, policies where they actually affirm LGBT. So that was sort of um, a, a real, real a watermark. So in 2013, the state, um, uh, the Safe and Supportive Education Act, which is called the Bullying Bill, uh, it was introduced and it wasn't passed until 2014. And it became very controversial uh, because we gave people information about what it was. It was it's supposed to be an anti-bullying bill. It always has a big, a good name, and everybody uh, is against bullying, and so no one was going to be against this bill. But what this bill really was was about in, in, implementing LGBT in the schools in a very aggressive way. People did not know that. I'm going to put this over here. So it became very controversial, but it did pass, and um, very quickly after that, the uh, Minnesota State High School League instituted a policy where transgender students uh, could be in the locker rooms of the other biological uh, children. And so, you know, that was another thing that we really uh, uh, tried to, uh, to focus on a little bit to let people know what was really going on. So comprehensive sex education uh, legislation uh, came up in, uh, uh, it was passed in the legislature in 2014. And, and it was not in the legislature, it was in the House. It passed in, uh, uh, excuse me, 2019, which was just last year. And um, it passed the House on an almost party line vote. And so I am going to focus on that legislation that passed in the House so that I can demonstrate that we are on the cusp of a new really intense takeover in the schools uh, in Minnesota and in states all over the country. This is a real strong push all over the country. Um, and so I'm gonna just focus on what it is because this will tell you what we have at stake and why uh, the 2020 elections will determine what happens on a lot of things. I mean, it will, because when it can go, when this, something this radical can go through the house, be past the house, um, and then that means that if they control the Senate, it'll pass the Senate too. 
uh, Governor Walz does support these. Now, it's become a little bit more uh, public uh, as an issue lately. Uh, just last week, Glenn Beck got in this information. And I don't know if anybody, I don't generally listen, in fact, I never listen to Glenn Beck, but somebody clued me in that, that he was talking about this. And so I listened to his radio show and he was giving out really good information. He put out a lot of the same stuff I'm gonna show you here today. I was really impressed. Somebody got to him with that good information. And then on his TV show that night, he also went after that, I didn't see it. So that has exposed it to a much wider audience. A lot of people, he has quite an audience, so. This is HF 1414. HF means it's in the House, SF means it's in the Senate. So it's a different name in the Senate. It's called the Comprehensive Sex Ed Bill, CSE. So it is a mandate for all public charter schools pre-K through 12th grade to teach comprehensive sex. So it was, it was heard in two House committees and then it was rolled into an omnibus education bill. That omnibus education bill has a different number, HF 2400. So if you go onto the website, the legislative website, and you look at HF 1414, which is what we're gonna look at, um, it'll say that it didn't pass. In fact, some legislators will tell you, oh no, that never passed. <laughs> it never passed the House. What didn't pass is HF 1414. What it did is they put it into an omnibus education bill. So this omnibus education bill um, is, uh, it's, they sometimes call it a garbage bill. It's all education funding for two years. It's Department of Education and their salaries and office buildings, all the schools, all the teacher salaries, school lunches, administration, busing, everything. So you can imagine, it's just a mammoth bill. So they brought this little bill, it's a little, it's small, and they brought it in and they tucked it in there. So it's just a little small part of this whole thing. So if you wanna vote against that bill, you have to vote against all the funding for education for two years. So you can see where, um, it is, uh, it, it was not a good thing. So when it, when they voted to put this into the, um, the omnibus bill, it became very, that, uh, one of the Republican legislators, her name is Peggy Bennett from, uh, from down in Albert Lee, uh, put up an amendment saying that they, she wants to delete all of that, just that, that whole thing, she wanted to delete it. So there was, then the debate went on, and it went on, and it went on, and it went on. So we had, pro we had provided the legislators with a lot of uh, background information that they don't often have uh, time to, um, you know, to do that kind of background. So um, it's now part of another bill. Okay, so... Uh, the handouts there give you a summary of what we, um, let's see, I'm trying to see where I go for this. I go over here. Okay, this is what you have in your hand. So we just distributed more than 50,000 of these handouts throughout the state in 2019. And if you go on our website, cplaction.com slash CSE, there is a roll call for which legislators voted to take it out and which voters voted to leave it, I mean, which legislators voted to put it in. And this, this handout, it was shocking to people because they had no idea it would be a tr dramatic change in what we're doing in, uh, uh, with kids in our schools and nobody knew. Um, so everyone in the state really needs to have a copy of this flyer and really share it with, with their circus of influence so that people know. It's just a summary of some of this information. Next, okay. So first of all, um, the Commissioner of Education um, will, it is a mandate, this, this number four, this, uh, this slide and the next one is, is demonstration that it is a mandate. The Commissioner of Education uh, and other qualified experts identify a couple of model comprehensive sexual education programs for secondary and elementary schools. So keep in mind, elementary means pre-K in the world of education, so we're talking about this is all eligible for them. Um, the Minnesota Department of Education, when they talk about other qualified experts, they rely on Planned Parenthood as the ultimate expert on comprehensive sex ed. And Planned Parenthood claims that mantle. They, they, rec they say they are. They also have, there's another group called SICUS, I have it here, the acronym is wrong, it's S-I-E, which is, uh, which I'll tell you more about in a little bit, and another called Advocates for Youth, and they're just very, very radical. So um, 
so four, okay moving along here no oh okay here there where am i <laughs> uh i want to go back there no i'm still going forward how do i go back there 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 okay uh okay number five here it says um this is just an explanation this is from the bill it says that the uh, superintendent has to submit to the commissioner assurance of compliance with the requirements for the section. So um, initially, uh, the bill said that, that, that you had to accept one of the model curriculum. When it went in to the, to the omnibus bill, they changed it a little bit to say that they could put their, make their own curriculum, but you had to submit it to the commissioner to make sure it was compliant with the requirements. So basically, we're going to go through what those requirements are, and if you do that, I mean, they're telling you it's still a mandate. So uh, some of the uh, the uh, de defenders of this will say it's local control because they can decide what they want to do. Yes, they can as long as it complies with what they want you to do. So it's it's just it's just a, another sleight of hand. Um, so who are the CSE players? And here I mentioned a couple of them, which we'll see here. Um, now, number, uh, let's see, everyone knows, by the way, anybody who's, you know, in the know at all knows that these are the people who are advocates, uh, who are the comprehensive, ah, now I'm going backwards again, 12, 11, 10, 9, there. Okay, so um, who does the Department of Education refer young people to as a resource for sexual health right now? On their website, the resources for teens and young adults, if you go onto their website. I'm not sure, this, this is, I found this a year or two ago, I don't know if it's still there. But Planned Parenthood, their national hotline, that's who they repeat, uh, uh, refer people to. That is their expert. So when they say they and a panel of experts are going to put together a model curriculum, this is who they're referring to. Okay. Um, this is what Planned Parenthood does. They lobby for CSE. Okay, now, it doesn't say anything about Planned Parenthood in the bill. Nothing. They're not referenced. So when this was brought up about Planned Parenthood's role, the, the, uh, the, the uh, defenders said, Planned Parenthood has nothing to do with this. This is not about Planned Parenthood. So I'm going to show you that they are it. They lobby for CSE. They promote comprehensive sex ed curriculum. They are the state's largest provider of CSE, and the bill invites them into the classroom to teach it, unlicensed teachers. Now, that, they don't use the name. They just do it by other ways. Here's an example of how they lobby. This is on their website, Support Comprehensive Sex Ed in Minnesota, and they say Minnesota doesn't have a standard statewide, district-wide, or school-wide curriculum for sex ed, this results in different people believing different things, and it's important that we create a statewide inclusive curriculum for comprehensive sex ed. They are lobbying for this. They're there at the Capitol, and um, the defenders will say, this isn't a curriculum. This is just a bill. Planned Parenthood is lobbying for this because it's a curriculum. That's the reason they're doing it. So here they are. Um, they are... Uh, when I'm number 10. Okay, this is an example of how they promote curriculum. CSC, they promote, uh, these are the books that are recommended for comprehensive sex ed by Planned Parenthood and all these other groups as well, I want you to know. Uh, this, the one at the bottom is book for preteens 10 to 14. It's perfectly normal. It's become very famous. And Glenn Beck put some stuff up on that uh, too, as I'm going to. I have a copy of the book here. If you'd like to look through it, you know, to see, you're welcome to. But I've got some pictures, and I think it's, you know, I, I don't like to deal with this stuff. None of us do, but we've got our kids involved. So the other one here is um, Sex, All You Need to Know, Progressive Sexuality Guide to Get You Through High School and College. Okay, that I have, too, a copy of here if you want to look at that. I've got a slide from their, their table of contents to show you what they're doing. So it basically is, this is the kind of stuff that they are promoting. I just wanted to let you know that before we go into exactly what it is. But for example, the All You Need to Know Guide, this is from the table of contents, and you can see what it is they're, they're, um, they're doing. And you can look at the table. There's a lot more on that table of contents, but um, it's, it's, 
unbelievable that this is what's being promoted for comprehensive sex ed in the schools. Dental dams for oral, safer oral sex. Okay, this is, uh, it's perfectly normal. Now we put this little warning on it because according to Minnesota statute 617.241 pictures in this book may violate obscenity laws. So <clears throat> we can't violate those obscenity laws. How, however, there are exemptions for schools. And so they can do that in the schools and not violate the obs obscenity laws. So um, we have blurred it out. They don't blur anything out. And when Glenn Beck, uh, did his, he said the same thing. He said, if I put it out here like, like uh, you, uh, um, li like this, the, the children see it, I would be liable uh, for, to be sued. He said, um, so we're gonna blur it out, but the kids don't get it blurred out. Interesting, YouTube demonetized that, that particular um, uh, you know, presentation um, because they said, the pictures were unacceptable. Okay, so in the public sphere, this is not acceptable. In the schoolroom for kids, now they say from, this is for 10 years and up, uh, but you know, it goes down le uh, much lower than that. And as you can see, they, uh, they equalize uh, sex as any kind, you know, whether it's oral, anal, or vaginal. And uh, this is for kids like, it says for 10 years and up, but it's actually, it goes much lower than that. So this is just some of the pictures. Is it appropriate for a 10 year old to see this? And that little thing is it uh, back there. We use this in the bullying bill because we knew when we were fighting that Safe and Supportive Schools Act in 2014, we knew that this was what, what, what it was about. So we were trying to tell people. Uh, that's why it's, there's a different, um, yeah. So um, it, it's all, it's, it's the kind of thing that they're doing, she, to, teaching them, showing them how to do masturbation and um, telling them it's a, a good thing. So, um, let's see here. This is demonstrating that, CS, that Planned Parenthood is the largest provider of sex education in the state and actually in the country. And this is from their website. Planned Parenthood is the largest provider. They say that, they reach nearly 50,000 people this is what they take credit for. So they are, uh, this is what they're about. Uh, okay, and finally, to demonstrate that they are invited into the classroom, this is part of the bill. Instruction in sexual health education may be provided by a person without a teaching license if they are a community organization that, is, that has necessary content expertise. So that is what Planned Parenthood is. They are the expertise on CSE. But I want you to know that this also invites gender activist groups into the schoolroom as well, non-licensed teachers. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. So we're gonna go in, more into the bill um, and uh, into some of the, what are the requirements of this? Let's see here, how do I do this? So sexual health education teaches, must teach, this is the requirement, must teach consent, bodily autonomy, and healthy relationships, including relationships involving diverse sexual orientations and gender identities. I'm gonna go through uh, those three things one at a time. First, we'll start with body auton bodily autonomy. Bodily autonomy in the world of uh, CSE, in the world of Planned Parenthood, in the, in the world of uh, radical uh, abortion rights, refers to the right to abortion. That's what bodily autonomy means. It means the right to abortion. So the people there will say to you in the, in the, in the legislature, this doesn't have anything to do with abortion. Abortion isn't in there at all. It isn't about abortion. When they talk, they just use different language. That's all they do. They use different language. And the public will have no way of knowing. You know, we are the ones that have to tell them that's what this is, okay? So they must teach about abortion. And um, it, this requires them to teach it. The other thing bodily autonomy refers to is uh, the right for children to be sexually active. That is very important because it's a key part of what they teach. And so I am going to show you 
a little bit about that because that's a that is one of the big things about CSE. They are sexualizing our children. They are telling them that they have the right to be sexually active. This is International Planned Parenthood Federation. It's around the, the it, it, they, it's, it's promoted everywhere, plus through the UN and other countries. Young People's Guide to Sexual Rights, an IPPF declaration. So this is from page 21. What does this right entitle? Any limitation on sexual rights must be non-discriminatory, including on the grounds of age. Okay. They cannot, you can't have any age limitations. And to be quite honest, what you're, you're opening the gates to there is adult on minor sex. That's coming down the road. But this is, this is what, they, they open that door there. But in any case, what they're saying is the right to be sexually active exists for all children regardless of age no matter what age gender or sexual orientation and then down below removal of parental co involvement or spousal consent laws those are their their goals that they want to um, to uh, accomplish this is uh, it is important for all young people around the world to be able to explore experience and express their sexualities so they're telling them they should it's a good thing this can only happen when young people's sexual rights are guaranteed. So they teach a, a values-free philosophy of sexuality to children and teens. Here it is, Planned Parenthood on Tumblr. Now Tumblr is something that you probably aren't familiar with, but they're popular with the teen and college age user, user groups. Um, and half of Tumblr's visitor base is under the age of 25. And here's what Planned Parenthood says. Since the number of sexual partners you've had doesn't say anything about your character, your morals, or your personality, <laughs> or about anything at all, there's nothing bad or unhealthy about having a big number of sexual partners. Okay. Now, one of the big defenses for <laughs> comprehensive sex ed is that it reduces STDs. It does not, and you can see why it does not. It introduces them to numerous sexual partners as a good thing. Sexual rights, like all human rights, are universal, inalienable, indivisible. So they put sexual rights as a human right, an international human right, on the basis, just like discrimination against race, religion, whatever. That is the, the place they're putting it. Now, keep in mind, this is an International Planned Parenthood Foundation, so they're dealing, they're putting this stuff through at the UN. UN is deeply involved in pushing this stuff through. So this is from their website, from their, their material. Sexuality is an integral part of being human for all young people. And if any of you are familiar with Alfred Kinsey's studies, and I'm not going to go into that because we do a lot of that, uh, letting people know about that, but in his experiments, he experimented with children as young as infants. And um, you know, his, his uh, whole uh, premise is that people, children are sexual pre-birth, and um, you know, he, was, he was a pervert. Um, so there, this actually comes, has a big history, getting to this about uh, it's part of being human. Sexuality and sexual pleasure are important for all young people. And they say the evolving capacities of children and young people must be recognized, whatever that means. So um, on page 15, they talk about, well, what is sexual pleasure? I mean, so they go into these things as, as part of their, what they want to teach as curriculum. Um, here we have International Planned Parenthood, and this is from their, uh, their, their document for, called Healthy, Happy, and Hot. It's, uh, it's the guide to sexual, to, to sexual rights for people living with HIV. So because the STDs are so rampant now, they're normalizing it. Everybody has them. It's not a big deal. It's just don't be a, don't be ashamed, um, you know, and you have the right regardless. And it's they they say here, this is their quotes: young people living with HIV have the right to decide if, when, and how to disclose their HIV status. So they're saying you can have sex with with other kids, other young people, other older whoever, and you never have to tell them. Don't feel like you have to tell them. Um, you know, down the lower uh, corner there on the left, you know best if and when it's safe for you to disclose your status. Um, so that's what they do. Um, and these are the people, by the way, that they are inviting into the classroom to teach. 
Okay, <clears throat> here we are with the same healthy, happy, and hot. Here they're just, <laughs> I mean, just look at this language. I don't want to read it. You can read it. It's just like, what are they telling these kids? Uh, you know, have fun, explore. It's just they've got, this, this is their layout. This is their visual, sexual pleasure. Um, you know, here are the things that you can do. It's just, it's really shocking and terrifying. So um, here we have, I'm going to go back to this, and that was bodily autonomy. Now, it's okay, so they have to teach bodily autonomy. So that gives them the mandate to teach this is their sexual right. That's what this law does. And we, we put a lot of this information out on the House floor through the legislators. They voted for it. Didn't matter. Didn't matter what people said. Okay, so here's consent. They have to teach consent. Children as young as 10 are being taught to consent to being sexually active, okay? They're telling them how to consent as if, you know, they're protecting them by telling them, you know, it isn't until you consent that, that, that anyone has a right, but you have the right to decide when to consent. So here they define it. In another part of the bill, they define what consent means. It means affirmative, conscious, and voluntary agreement to engage in interpersonal, physical, or sexual activity. Okay, so they are required to teach, and they see that this is really key to teach every child that you have the right, and we're gonna tell you how to consent so that you, it is, it was voluntary on your part. Now, when you're talking about young people, like, I mean, younger than 10, but 10, 11, 12, 13, you know, it's considered statutory rape if, if you have a, an adult having sex. Why? Because a child doesn't have the wherewithal to make the kind of decisions that an adult can make. They have no background, they don't have the filter, they don't have the context. They, they are easily manipulated. So they're trying to tell these young people, you can. Um, any, and so uh, as we go, I'm gonna, it also sets the children up for abuse and manipulation. And the reason is, is that if you can get them to consent, you know, it's okay. So here is a guy named Yako Buyans, and he is an internationally recognized for his work to stop sex traffic. And he, he put out the movie Eight Days, which is just a powerful movie about how young people are being pulled into trafficking. It's, I, I would really recommend it. And anyway, he says, um, Comprehensive sex edge in the public schools does the grooming for pimps and predators. It prepares the kids, you know, to say it's okay, things that they would have a natural instinct to say, yuck, you know, they break down all those barriers. They break down the barriers to talking about sex. They break down the barriers to seeing things. They break down the barriers to actually playing games having to do with sex. And you'll find in a lot of the CSE curriculum, they'll tell the, 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 uh, the teachers in the teacher guides what kind of games to play. And it's just amazing, because they're, they're mixed, mixed uh, sexes, boy, boy and girl. And I'll tell you, it's, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go into that. So um, going back up to this one, I want to point out healthy relationships, the third one there, including relationships involving diverse sexual orientations and gender identities. It's kind of vague, you know, whoa, what exactly, exactly does that mean? What that means is they're required to teach SOGI, social orientation, gender identity. That's what that means, as healthy relationships. They must, it's a mandate. So we know what kind of curriculum they'll put together for that already. Because in 2017, the Minnesota Department of Education published and distributed its guidance for sexual identity in the schools. It's called a toolkit for ensuring safe and supportive schools. They couldn't mandate it on the local districts because they're independent on this. But if this bill passes, these guidelines would be the mandate. Now many schools actually did adopt their guidance. And you'd be surprised, probably, to know what that your um, some of the local schools in your area might do that. Let's see here. No, I don't know where I want to go. I'm trying to figure out how to. So 
just for your information, the, the production of this guide, uh, this toolkit, uh, we, we spoke to that. They had a public hearing and uh, testimony was given. I, in that case, I offered to testify, but th they never got to some of the details. Uh, but it was quite controversial. They, they had to have this hearing. It was required of them, but then it all went underground mm -hmm. after that. So they sent it out to all the districts. <coughs> <coughs> and what's happening behind the scenes is Planned Parenthood and uh, other organizations are coming to directly to the administration and the teachers and they're lobbying for it and they're saying, you need to do this. So they pick it up um, sometimes just because they, you know, they've been lobbied to do it and people don't even know it's that they're being lobbied to do it. So the Transgender Toolkit um, is, you know, it, it includes like gender non-conforming students. You have to understand, gender non-conforming means anything anything, anything, and that, I mean, nothing is beyond the, 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 um, the boundaries. It is a 61-page guidebook, and by the way, the Minnesota Family Council has a very good um, document that they have put together regarding this, this document, and explains it, and explains uh, the, the meaning of it and the difficulties. The authors are from the National Center for Lesbian Rights and Gender Spectrum. The contributing authors are from the organizations like the National Center for Lesbian Rights, Gay Spectrum, Gender Spectrum, Human Rights Campaign Foundation, and the American Civil Liberties Union. It includes an endorsement uh, by the National Education Association. And um, so this is a statement that they make, for example. Not having your gender identity respected and affirmed in their daily lives will likely cause them significant psychological distress and they have no scientific background backing for that. But in other words, affir affirmation of what they are, are doing, um, I mean, of, of gender confusion, affirmation is the only healthy way to respond to them. Um, they encourage schools to introduce young people to transitioning and, and transitioning to another gender, and they discuss it with them. This recommendation admits that the goal of this whole thing is indoctrinating young children into accepting radical gender ideology and to transform their beliefs and values. Um, for example, it requires everybody in the school to use gender preferred pronouns. And now, you know, the pronouns that they use are Z, her, hers, whatever, just real, 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 whatever the student wants to be defined as, maybe him, her, and him, him and his, if it's a, if a woman, you must uh, comply with that. So it also, uh, uh, mandates, now this isn't a mandate yet, but this is what this toolkit uh, is promoting, uh, sharing bathrooms, locker rooms, and overnight field trip accommodations for transgenders. So a guy can say he's, a, there's no evidence, and no child has to provide any evidence that they are you know, uh, diagnosed as gender dysphoric. They simply need to say, I feel like I am whatever, and that's all it takes. So let's see. And now I'm going to move on to SICUS, uh, that which is a, a key organization. It's the um, Sexual Sexuality Information and Education Council of the U.S. They are really like the superstructure for Planned Parenthood. I've got some stray things in there somewhere. Um, SICUS is extraordinarily influential on policymakers. They have created national sexuality standards and the national teacher preparation standards. They aren't official from, from government, but they promote them as if they are. And a lot of the states figure, hey, they've already got some national standards, we're just gonna take them. They are as radical as they come and they are the largest promoter of comprehensive sex education in the country. They are also very well funded. So SICUS here, um, it, this is one of their tweets. It says, we need to, pro pro okay, th this tells you a little bit more about SICUS because sex ed for them is social change. It's all about social activism, getting kids activated. So um, they, at this point, we leave the world of health education and biology, and we go into radical sexual uh, uh, activism. 
Okay, so I was saying here, we need to prioritize educating young people about all of these concepts. So the question down below on Twitter was, what is required to build power in spite of the forces of white supremacy, anti-blackness, patriarchy, racism, xenophobia, and others conspiring against people of color? And their answer is, we need to prioritize educating young people about all these concepts early on. Sex education is a golden opportunity to teach youth about dismantling systems of power and oppression that perpetuate white supremacy, homophobia, transphobia, and more. They're just right out there. They're not, they're not pulling any punches. This is their logo. Sex ed is a vehicle for social change, full stop. They say that's their logo. What is this sex ed for social change? What does this mean? Now, this is off of their website. While sex education is a necessary sexual health tool, it can and should be so much more than that. With sex education, we have a golden opportunity to create a culture shift. So this is about changing the values and attitudes and beliefs of the culture. Meanwhile, the verbiage out there is that we're supposed to be respecting all cultures. But the culture of America is to be disrespected. It is to be changed. The whole system is set up to change the culture. They task tackle the misinformation, shame, and stigma that create the basis for so many rights issues. And they list these. They call reproductive justice, it's abortion, LGBT, you know, it's the same stuff. Dis but notice, dismantling white supremacy is right in there with their top five issues that they're all about. So they're right in there. I mean, it's just like, this is all one, uh, you know, uh, movement together. Um, I should say too, when they say, tackling the, the misinformation and shame and stigma, uh, you know, it's like to be sexually active should never be stigmatized. And there's, uh, you maybe have heard the term, maybe not, that they really oppose what's called slut shaming. It means that you're dis, you know, disapproving of things and they, they attack people for disapproving of being actually sexual active. So here they are again, this is right from their website. We commit to dismantling the systems of power and oppression um, it ha across the intersections of age. Now notice as intersections of age, again, intersections of age that means it doesn't matter whether one of the sexual partners is 36 years old and the other one is 12 you know that's the intersections of age they have it kind of in in a, but when they know what they're saying and nobody else who is, doesn't think like that knows what they're saying um and it takes the stigma away from you know anything so there's there are no values that are okay except for acceptance of it all so CSE is a strategy for political ideology. It's not just free sex. It's a political movement. And um, this is more of the same thing. I'm not going to hit that again. That, you know, the firm's identities and experiences is stretch beyond binaries, so it's not just male and female, and heteronormative expectations. They don't want those expectations. See here again, it's see because we believe that sex ed can spark the social change we need in response to a variety of pressing issues. That's why we're here now. So um, back to, let's see, um, schools um, must refer Planned Parenthood. Okay, so uh, the, the program must provide students with information about local resources and, and you know that means going to the Planned Parenthood refer, without parental consent or knowledge, by the way. And they actually cannot tell the student, the parents, because of data practices, privacy laws. So just a quick comment there. Um, as uh, Julie mentioned, this is not just Minnesota. The, the same thing is going on over in Wisconsin. And the, uh, the Madison School District, they had uh, this implemented. And we're very explicit about the, the need for their uh, staff, and teachers, and so forth to Hide, hide all of these things from parents to the point of keeping two separate sets of books, one that could be shown to parents and one not. Uh, this is all out in the open. In, I mean, in their trainings with teachers. Uh, so a lawsuit was, was uh, uh, 
filed, and just like a week or two ago, uh, it, it was uh, a judge uh, declared that that was uh, inappropriate, and I think there was an injunction against the school district. But it's happening uh, all over, and I'm sure it's happening here. It's, a it's happening all over the country. It's a really big push. Thank you very much. I didn't know that. Um, it also means that they are, will refer children to gender activist groups. So if somebody says, you know, I'm, I don't know, I'm feeling like I maybe might, whatever, um, they refer them to. The other thing about this is this idea that it's medically accurate information, okay? So we're talking about more than one sex. How can that be, that, there's nothing medically accurate about it. It's just this, they, they throw these terms in there and they don't have any substantiation for them at all. And what they mean by this is it must include information that you that gender identity is, is, a, is a spectrum. That's medically accurate to them. So when they say medically accurate, it means something to us. It means that there's some background, some scientific studies and stuff. Nothing. They just throw it in there, in the bill, in the bill. There isn't any medically accurate information. I mean, anybody who's going to say that there are more than two genders, you write off the chart right away. And so then the other thing in here um, is you must respect community values. That one really gets me. Like, whose community values? I mean, like, and how did they decide? Did they have focus groups? Did they have town halls? Did they ask people? Of course they didn't. It's not community. It's a violation of all of our community values. And then they throw this stuff in there. It must respect community values. So if you, if you object, uh, you know, they'll say, oh, the law requires them to respect community values. It's just a complete scam. Okay, the next thing I want to show you is, is, a, is an example of what they consider medically accurate. And this is something that is in most schools right now. Maybe you've seen it, the gender-bred person. When you look at, or the, there's another one that's, I can't remember. I've never seen that. <laughs> okay, it's in, if you go into, you know, it's, on the, it's on the walls, okay? The gender-bred person is used by the um, Minnesota Department of Education staff to train teachers and administrators across the state in gender ideology. So there are four different parts to it, diverse sexual orientations and genders, and it's a mix and match. Mix and match. Notice they use the uh, gender-bred. Who are they focusing on? These are way like preschool, kindergarten, first grade. This is, I mean, the, 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 imp, the, the focus on the very young, on challenging their gender is powerful right now. And there are so many books out that they put out, just so many to teach the kids that you aren't necessarily the way you were born. So the, okay, so you've got the gender identity, you've got the gender expression, you've got the biological sex, and then there's who you're attracted to. And they have different parts there, who you're attracted to, whatever, and then you can mix and match. And um, yeah, that's, that's, very, that's out there in the schools all over. That used to be the gender uh, uh, unicorn. Yes. But that there was something wrong with that, and I forget what it was from their perspective. So then they went to the gender bread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now um, I'm 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 going I have a few slides on this, and I'm gonna skip over most of them because basically it's making the point. Okay, they want to say that students feel more informed. They make safer choices and have healthier outcomes, resulting in fewer unplanned pregnancies and more protections against STDs and STIs. That's their uh, statement of belief, and it's uh, and so there's this uh, uh, idea that it's it, they, they put it out there again, just saying, oh, this is really effective. There is a there a study here from the CDC out of Washington State on they've had CSC in their curriculum for quite a while. And, uh, and you can see 2013 is where they really instituted it and, and the, uh, the chlamydia went way up. There's the, the, the map right there. This is uh, the, just the STD, HIV went way up, 2013. Gonorrhea, syphilis, same thing. And there's a, there's a book out there called Reexamining the Evidence for Comprehensive Sex Ed in Schools from last year. And they actually, they look at all the studies that are being used to say this is okay and they critique them. And then they show the studies that have actually been done in a more scientific way. And it's a, it's a very uh, good, in, it's, it's re-examining the evidence, uh, research findings in the United States from the Institute for Research and Evaluation. And um, 
I won't go through all of them here, but just as a summary, out of the 60 school-based CAC studies, we found no evidence of effectiveness at producing sustained reductions in teen pregnancy or STDs. Surprise, surprise. One study showed evidence of effectiveness <coughs> at delaying sexual initiation, but evidence from multiple replication studies was not confirmatory. Um, this is teen abstinence and condom use. You know, let me just say, um, I have heard people, a couple of different people who, who speak against this, who have done, uh, they have taught CSE for, for Planned Parenthood. So they know what they're talking about and they've come to understand this is deadly and they've come around to the other side and are now, Monica Klein is, is, is somebody, she, I mean, she, she's just excellent at talking about this. But the thing about the condom use, well, and also birth control pills in young children, they know it's not gonna work. They absolutely know that they will not use them correctly. They're too young, they're too impulsive, they're not careful enough, they just, and as far as taking a birth control pill, to have the same one every, every day that you take it, they just don't, that's not a child thing. And if there's parents, especially that isn't supervising it, it's not gonna happen. They know that they're telling the kids this is how to do it safely and that it won't work. So just, just to tell you, I mean, that's how insidious this is. CSE failure rate at producing sustained effects on targeted outcomes included 88% failure to delay, to delay teen sexual initiation and 94% failure to reduce unprotected sex. So there, I mean, so there's this false dichotomy um, between uh, that they put out there is, okay, so you don't like comprehensive sex ed, so um, it's abstinence only and we don't really teach them anything. And those are two dichotomies they put together. But, you know, it's just a false dichotomy. I mean, you can teach some basic principles and biology, like where you know how it's done, but they are teaching a green light for teen sex. They're sexualizing the kids. And so that the dichotomy there is totally false. Okay, now. Just one quick addition there. Uh, much of this is uh, in instituted into the curriculum, not necessarily as standalone, uh, lessons and so forth. It gets incorporated into various other elements of their of their day, and therefore the opportunity for parents to uh, remove their uh, children from from that uh, is essentially uh, lost yeah. entirely. Yeah, and they, you know, the law, our Minnesota law does them does allow them to opt their children out of sex ed courses. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it's not in the sex ed course just there, it's in the literature, it's in events. They bring in speakers, they bring in people who perform, they bring, and they have, they have posters all over, and they have gay sex, uh, not gay sex, um, they call it, um, they have clubs anyway that, that, that promote this, student clubs that promote it, and, and they, 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 they persecute kids that don't go along with it. I mean, they have days, you know, they have pride days. Pride days are a really big thing. Everybody's gotta wear the thing, and if they don't, I mean, they're just demonized. So, I mean, it's really, really tough on kids if, they're, if you're, you're gonna be faithful. So now, I am gonna shift over, this is, this is a CSE, and I'm gonna shift over just briefly to some other issues in Minnesota having to do with sexual orientation. And could, we're almost done. Well, uh, if, if you could wrap up your formal stuff in like five or 10 yep, minutes, I can. and then allow yep. Time yep. For, uh, this will just take a few minutes, okay? okay. This one is, um, let's see here, Minnesota. There's an Equal Rights Amendment in Minnesota. It's, um, it, it, this is what it says, it's HR 13, HF 13. Okay, it passed uh, in 2019 in the House. Equality under the law must not be abridged or denied on account of gender. <laughs> Equal Rights Amendment is a women's rights issue, right? Oh no, <laughs> on account of gender. But what is the title of the amendment? According to the law, that was, the bill that was passed, the title shall be Equal Rights Amendment. This isn't an Equal Rights Amendment. This is Equal Rights Amendment for sexual identity. Sexual identity, and it's, it would be putting it into the Constitution. It's a constitutional amendment for civil rights, no discrimination of any kind on any level, anywhere, between anybody having to do with sexual identity or orientation is the most radical thing that you can imagine. It undermines, it's not about women's rights. 
It undermines women's rights. It erases the very concept of male and female when you do that. There is basically, there is no male and female. If you can be whatever you want, whenever you want, and you can change it, and you cannot be discriminated against. So, um, I mean, it is really radical. And so it passed. And they think they can get it past the, it has to go to the, the public to vote on. Well, if you call it an Equal Rights Amendment, you know, and everybody who testified in favor of this talked about women's issues, the long struggle for women's rights, starting with suffrage and the uh, income discrimination. No one testified about what, about gender identity. And that's what it is. They didn't want people to be focused on it, and they won't be. So they wanted, they thought that they were going to get uh, Republicans to be afraid to be against an ERA. So they counted on getting enough Republicans. The problem is that we gave, we made this rule public. And we told everybody, we're, we're telling you guys what this is. You vote for this and you are really on the wrong side. And so, I mean, it really put the brakes in the Senate. So it didn't get out of the Senate. Otherwise, all you need is a couple of different senators to come over and you can pass it because there's a very, you know, but because of, because of the incredible, I mean, we had a debate that went on, it was hot on this. It wouldn't have happened if we had, they, they would just passed it. I mean, who's gonna vote against an ERA? I mean, you know, it's just, that's the way it works up there, I'm afraid. So <coughs> um, that's one, that's very, so it, again, if we lose, if the Republicans lose control of the Senate, I'll say this will go through like water, you know, through a sieve, just just like it did in the House. It's done, just like that. And Governor Wall supports it. So, this is um, okay. This little more on this. Uh, ERA has always used the word sex, not gender. The only other ERA state to use the word gender is Rhode Island, and that amendment was passed in 1986 when the meaning of gender was not generally understood to mean gender identity. That is one's feelings about men. Me. So we would be way ahead. The House voted for this. No other state except Rhode Island, who didn't know what they were doing at the time. Okay, the other was conversion therapy ban, HF12. That um, uh, minors questioning their sexual identity are prohibited from receiving counseling that would help them live consistently with their biological sex. All therapy for gender confusion must be affirmative. And that um, passed the House as part of an, of an omnibus bill again. It didn't pass as a bill alone. It went into a big omnibus bill, which is House and Human Serv Health and Human Services. When it got to the Senate, it was highly debated. Um, and there were, there were two Republican senators who were willing to switch and vote for it. And they didn't. That's all I can say. And I mean, it, it was touch and go, and the governor supports it. So it was, it was kept out by God's grace. Um, it is really, really heavily pushed. I mean, this is deadly. And um, so 19 other states have already enacted a conversion therapy ban. They call it conversion therapy. What it is is an anti, what it is is an, is, is an affirmative uh, bill, <laughs> or anti, you, you have to affirm is, is all it is. There's no, I mean, it, you don't even have to talk about Christ and salvation or what the Bible says. I mean, you should be able to, but it doesn't even have to involve that. All it has to be is that you're not affirmative, and it's called conversion therapy. That's it. That's essentially a speech. Oh, ban. totally. Denial of free speech. Um, and, you know, this, just so you understand, in, in the Minnesota legislature, uh, because essentially nothing happened in the 2020 uh, session, they're, they're going to have to go back and repass this, uh, which will happen easily in the House. Uh, but then it'll move on to the Senate. And again, depending what happens in November in the elections, uh, this either will be reality for us or, or it won't. It depends how, you, how we vote as a culture. But uh, this is really it's serious. Just a, okay, and the last one is in Congress, the Equality Act, H.R. 5. It would amend the 1964 Civil Rights Act to establish sexual, ooh, how did that happen? What did I do? Okay. Um, to establish sexual orientation and sexual identity as a civil right equivalent to race. It would prohibit discrimination across all areas of life, employment, housing, schools, public spaces, and services, make no exceptions for churches and religious institutions, 
at all. I mean, that's the compromise that some people wanted to put out there in, in past Congress. Um, and, uh, you know, it didn't go anywhere in the Senate. It wasn't picked up. But some of the senators were saying, we'll have a compromise. We'll just, we'll do this, except that we'll just make, carve out some exceptions for, for religious behavior. No, it's a non-starter. They absolutely want to go after the churches and the institutions, the schools, the child care, everything, absolutely. So that is the end of my presentation. I have, I have one thing which I don't think I have time to show. It's an 11 minute video. And um, you know, I could, I don't know if you want to do anything with it, but I, it, what it is is, a, is an individual who um, was a transgender, I should say. Okay, so here back on HR5. Um, it passed the House of Representatives by a vote of 236 to 197 in the Congress. Yeah. It establishes that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in 1994, a law aimed at protecting religious liberty, cannot be used to discriminate. They actually put that in the law. The Senate refused to vote on it by a vote of 51 to 42 in June. Okay, so, and then this is a guy named Jeffrey who is an ex-transgender, and he goes through how he came to becoming a transgender, what he went through, and how he transitioned out and how betrayed he feels. And it's, it's 11 minutes and it's very impactful, but I don't think we have the time for it. So. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. I, yeah. I if you want not. a copy of it, you sure can have okay, it. Okay, so. thank you. So uh, I wanna give us uh, at least uh, 10 minutes here, I think, to have some dialogue. Uh, and then at that point, we'll break for lunch. And uh, Julie, are you able to stay sure. for lunch so you can Did you still look at it, or? Oh yeah, those that did, that's the reason there was any fight at all. Is that because we gave them the information and they used it. They used it on the floor, they brought it out. Um, but the others, the, the people who have de decided to do this, it doesn't matter. They have already, it does not matter. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. matter. Facts wouldn't be an issue. They, are, they have decided to do it because they're, they're basically, this is what they are have signed up for. And you know, they do what they're told and this is it. And so right now, in I mean, there are those who voted for this, that's these, these flyers, those handouts that I gave out. We are trying to get those out to, to areas, especially in the areas where the legislators voted for it. Mm -hmm. So they can take these and give it to, as, as an organization, a nonprofit, we don't endorse candidates. We cannot. But what we can do is give them information. And so the, the candidates or the people, the local people can say, see this? Uh, Representative Hood, voted for this, he's one of them that voted for this, and usually people just can't believe it. They absolutely can't believe it. We get calls from people and say, what are you talking about? Yeah. Are there, Jason? Speaking organizationally, how do people either support or get involved with your organization? Well, um, we have a website, it's called um, cplaction.com. And um, there's a lot more information there and um, we, you know, you can you can email us if you want help. But the big thing that we're, we're we're asking people right now to do is to help get these. I mean, we'll give you as many copies of these flyers as you want. We're not selling them. That's one of the things we do. We want we want to be able to speak to groups to tell them because they just don't know. Um, they maybe people have heard some, but they don't know very much, and they don't believe it. So that's the the biggest way that that. Um, that you could get involved right now um, is if anybody's willing to take this information and do their own speaking in their own groups, we're welcome that. We'll just share everything we have. We'd share this, this PowerPoint. We have a lot of, we have YouTubes, um, you know, that are out there about a lot of this information that are available to people. So if anybody wants more um, like videos or um, articles, there's plenty of articles on our website about it. Um, just getting the information out and then helping those who are, who are willing to vote against it. I just, we have to, you know, and, and those who are challenging these people need help. And I mean, sometimes it's just the grassroots people that are able to pass out the, we, that's where we get the most help is just people in their neighborhoods and they say, come to our house, we're gonna invite 35 people. Will you talk to us? Absolutely, we will. Do you coordinate with other groups like, say, the Minnesota Family Council? Yeah, definitely. 
we had a rally actually in September, September 17th, um, last fall, and it was at the Capitol, and um, you know they were helping us with that too. But we we had people from all over the state come. It wasn't as many as I'd hoped, but there were several hundred there. I I was looking for a thousand, but okay. Other the deterioration of uh, of the biblical view on sex and forest is so deteriorated in this country, and I mean I just. Things are happening, and thank you for giving us this information. In fact, I'm probably going to contact you about getting some of this, more of this. But um, I just heard the, uh, the other day, over the weekend, that from, um, well, I'm not sure if it was L.A. or where it was, but they just changed their local law that doesn't require a pedophile any longer to be registered as long as there's a 10-year age difference. Mm -hmm. That's California. Yeah. That's California. Yeah, yeah. right. And someone is there looking at undoing that, but once it's made law, it's really hard to change it back. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I think it has been signed by the governor. Now they're trying to yes, undo claw it. back and, and right. alter some of it. But right, because the, the person that brought the law forward apparently has some history in this area. Sure, mm -hmm. right. In fact, uh, just to say that when I, at the beginning, I talked about an Okahannapan uh, school district and they had this lawsuit against them. <clears throat> One of the key players in that was a, a, a teacher named Jeffrey Fetek. He, he taught uh, um, dance, not uh, drama. He taught drama. And he just was, he just pushed this. He made, he got a, an article that just uh, 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 smeared uh, you know, people that were in the, the school board members and, and, and others, one of our board members who was involved in, just smeared them in an article in The Spectator, which is a national magazine. It became a national, like, tragic thing. Here's the school district that's causing children, help, gave children to commit suicide. Well, just within the last couple of months, mm -hmm. this guy uh, was, was arrested for... Uh, predator, did you, are you aware of that? That was in, in the papers. He was in Anoka Hennepin at that time, you know, having, uh, sexually abusing these kids, some of them that did commit suicide. So why were they committing suicide? I mean, it wasn't because of the neutrality policy. It was because he, now, and so what happened is, what reason it's so much later is because these Young people have become adults and finally are getting strong enough to say, I'm going to come out. And so they're starting to actually say what was really going on. Meantime, I mean, they had to change their policy because the federal government under Obama administration forced a federal consent decree upon them to force them to teach this stuff. for this kind of thing comes from the belief that the reason sexuality is a problem is because somebody condemns it. If you can erase the condemnation, if you can erase the moral dimension of sexuality, then everything will be fine. And that's the whole premise of this thing. If you teach all this, it's perfectly normal, nothing wrong with it, then everything's going to be wonderful. And if you accept that even a little bit, it's hard to vote against it. Because you're condemning these particular people, they're they're perfectly okay. Why do you just leave? Why don't you just leave them alone? Mm -hmm. um, and the, we have a creator who says no, sexuality is for a purpose, and these other things, it's not good. And that's a, that's a, a bigoted standard. That's a horrible thing to think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have boundaries on our highways. It's for our protection. Right. Why not that's boundaries right. on our activities? Yeah, it's for our protection. Ultimately, it is a case where. If, if you believe that there is a, a fundamental order built, first of all, into the physical world, uh, that God has infused order here, he created it, uh, and therefore that there is also a fundamental order in the social world, um, you know, if, if you can get rid of the, 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 the order within the physical world, which is essentially what evolutionary biology is intended to do and does quite effectively. Uh, once that's gone, 
then the social order in the social realm quickly follows, is destroyed, uh, and chaos ensues, which is exactly the point that, that what they want. This is all highly orchestrated, but ultimately it does go back to first, uh, as President Woodford said, first uh, article issues of creation, physical creation. Once you lose that, then the rest of this all is going to follow mm -hmm. very naturally and quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you notice, my perspective here is not from a Christian perspective. I mean, even though it's the values are all Christian, the reason being is that we are our audience isn't just, just Christian. But the church really needs to be presenting these to their own congregations from their own perspective. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is what's happening to our children and their, their, their faith is being destroyed. I mean, you get into sexual promiscuity and it separates you from the family, from your parents. It separates you from all institutions and they, the, 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 the um, <clears throat> the evidence is, is that it also creates a very rebellious spirit. So we have, you know, you're creating rebellion in the children. And our churches need to know that this is imposed on them from early on. We published a book just recently called It's Just Ducky. And it's about a duck that realizes, you know, he wants to be a rooster. But he realizes in the end, you know, how it's a children's book. And it's a really nice book. And it's one. And there are like hundreds of them from the other side that are being given to these kids that are telling them that you are what you think you are. I was teaching confirmation this morning and they said they're ninth graders and I thought I'd study on Genesis chapter 2 entered into the talk of food and he was under the Father Almighty and they still had on earth and as a part of that simply teaching in Genesis 2 God created a strange image male and female he created them back of my mind I'm actually as I'm saying that I'm thinking this is clearly against the culture that we're teaching these kids right here so hopefully he's telling them you know God created who you are you're wonderfully made male and female and just try to repeat that repeat that but knowing that when they leave this place they're going to be out there and it's just going to be a totally different message that they're going to hear in so many different especially when it gets around schools mm -hmm. and public schools. Mm -hmm. What a well, challenge. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think it's time for us to uh, end the conversation here. Thank you very much. We appreciate it so much. And